is going to introduce to you our keynote speaker. Thank you. So, um, everybody hear me? So seeing as uh, it's the 10th anniversary of GIS Day in Pennsylvania, it's very fitting that uh, we have this individual here to speak with us today. Um, Chris uh, is a big part, I believe, of how GIS and Esri's growth in the past years. And he is a native Pennsylvanian. He went to uh, high school outside Philadelphia. He is uh, a graduate of Penn State University. Uh, he currently lives in California right now at our, near our, head, uh, our headquarters, but um, has come back home to speak with us on this 10th anniversary. So please offer a big round of applause for Chris Capelli. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? All right. Uh, well, first of all, I want to welcome the high school students who came out today to GIS Day to celebrate with us. So thanks for coming out, and we'll try to make this interesting. Uh, okay, so now okay? Okay, good. So uh, let's see. Uh, what do I say in GIS Day other than congratulations? You've survived another year as a GIS professional. Uh, that's actually what GIS Day is for. It's, um, I was just kidding. <laughs> Oh, thank you. You're laughing at my poor joke, so thank you for that. Um, to me, what GIS Day really means is it's a day for uh, us GIS professionals to kind of reflect on what have we done in the last year and what's our ambitions for the coming year or the coming years. So GIS Day to me has always been kind of a, a special day in the calendar uh, for, for that reason. And what I wanted to do today was really just enlighten you a little bit to maybe beyond Pennsylvania, and then bring it back to Pennsylvania. I've been really fortunate in my career since, um, since joining Esri to be able to travel all over the world and um, work with people exactly like you and me all over the planet. And you know, as we celebrate this GIS Day, I think one of the key things I always try to also keep in mind is there are GIS professionals all over the world who face the exact same challenges as you do have the exact same situations that you do, um, have the exact same passion, are interested in, in science or in communications or in helping people understand geography or using geography as a tool to help them understand the thing that they're passionate about, whether it's watersheds or, or lands trusts or, or whatever it be. I think that's, that's the other thing. You're, you're part of this ginormous global community so take some solace in knowing that, um, you know, for the other 364 days, as you go about your work and kind of struggle and, and, and kind of celebrate your achievements, realize that people like you all over the world are, are probably doing the exact same thing. I think that's kind of a, a cool thing about GIS Day. It's a global event. Now, the other thing uh, that, you know, I have to recognize is you. I mean, boy, you, you see things you're very odd people. Um, uh, well, you know, we see things differently as, as people who understand GIS technology. You know, it's not natural for you to look out at the environment around us and then immediately start segregating information into layers and then thinking about the attribute names you're going to call those things when you organize those things into layers. You know, it's, just, it's a special skill. And it's a skill that I think it's worth recognizing that jazz professionals have. The ability to look into the real world and be able to bring it to its digital twin. I don't know a better way of saying it. I mean, you, what you've done is you've, you're creating digital twins of the ecosystems and the environments that you're managing with your organization. And I think that's an impressive thing. And I would just remind you on GIS Day that part of GIS Day is welcoming others into our community. That's why I think having the high school uh, students here and young adults is so important because we want to open their eyes to the power of geography and GIS and, and especially the career, um, career alternatives that exist. So uh, as you start to think about, you know, GIS and GIS Day, I can't help but think, you know, 
one of the reasons I think we're all in this is in our tiny way, we're helping solve problems. Because if you read the news, and unfortunately I spend a lot of time on airplanes now, and I, I, I read a lot of news from different perspectives. And I'll tell you, I, I sometimes get off the plane and I, I, I'm depressed because it's so gloom, uh, so doomed. There's so much conflict between the human environment and the natural environment. I mean, you can't argue that humans are consuming natural resources at a rate that's fairly unprecedented, uh, certainly in our lifetimes, but in actually the lifetimes of all of our species. I think we also face the challenges that are associated with that. You know, there's pollution, there's there's, there is change in the environment. We can observe, uh, we can observe temperature differences. We can observe changes in, in the weather patterns. Um, so, you know, we had some big problems that we're all trying to kind of knock at in our own special way. And, you know, unfortunately, the pace of that change is radically increasing. It's not decreasing. It's not slowing down. I mean, everything to me feels like it's coming at us faster. I mean, 30 years ago when I graduated from Penn State, Jesus, I, the, the world seemed slower, easier, uh, easier to comprehend. Technology wasn't changing as much. Um, now I feel like technology literally changes every day when I open up a web browser, there's some new tech, there's some new thing to try, there's some new app. So how, is that, is that just me or are you feeling the same thing? Oh good, so I'm not the only one technology challenged now. I'm a technologist, I'm challenged by the technology. Um, and I don't mean just GIS, I mean like everything. Literally watching my, my children who are now, it's not children, they're all adults. And, you know, I remember um, my eldest daughter was on Facebook and friended me. I thought it was such a joyous day. Um, <laughs> my third daughter, not so lucky there. She actually said that her older sister, and she's only four years older, is old because she uses Facebook. She's, an, she's, a, she's a Snapchatter. Uh, so, yeah. So what do we do? I mean, what do we do with that kind of pace of change and all the things that, well, I think, frankly, as GIS professionals, we keep whacking at it. We keep helping our organizations that we're working with to understand the value of geography and GIS. We help them understand how to illuminate the challenges that they face and the interrelationships or interconnectivity between that organization and the organizations that do work with it through the lens of exactly what you were doing before I, I stepped up here, using story maps, using maps, using your expressions of geographic analysis to help people see a different way. That's actually, to me, what location intelligence is. Location intelligence is an outcome. It's an outcome when GIS professionals il help illuminate an issue or topic for people that they can now make more informed and better decisions. Now, as part of this, um, you know, I think we all practice this notion of the science of where, you know, and call it what you like, but it's not just about the GIS technology, it's about how we use it. And I've always thought this is kind of akin to the scientific approach. You know, it's, it's not just a, I got some software and I just went for it. You're GIS professionals, you understand the importance of all the different things that go into making a, a really good informed decision. You consider, um, what coordinate system you're using. You, you consider whether you're using a, a local units, imperial units, kilometers. You, you're always kind of thinking about, you know, how is the best way to approach this project I'm working on? And I think that's important because all those things, measuring, analyzing, understanding, collaborating, all precedes helping people change and helping them make a better decision. And I think you, you can't talk about GIS without talking about you know, this fundamental framework of how we as GIS professionals approach the approach work. Now, uh, as my children remind me all the time, I'm old now, so um, 30 years ago when I graduated from Penn State, GIS was quite different. I mean, um, for those of us who were around then, you know, we remember something that's akin to the DOS prompt. You really had to want to make a GIS system do something for you. I know Two thirds of this audience has no idea what a DOS prompt is, so I'll just kind of like drop it like that and just say, back in the old days, it snowed every day in Pennsylvania. <laughs> we, were, we had to walk to school and GIS was really hard. Uh, 
but we've all made it easier for the next generation. Um, so, but I think what's actually happened is, you know, GIS has, has changed. People still use GIS as a transactional system to maintain the authoritative record of their assets and resources. You know, it's kind of like the accounting system for your organization. It's your geo accounting system. That's primarily what people generally think of GIS is. And now what's really kind of emerging is more of this mapping and location intelligence. And making mapping in GIS actually, I don't know, easier, uh, more approachable. Certainly leveraging the power uh, that comes with new technologies. And I think, you know, today GIS isn't really just about analytics. It's not just about data storage. It's not just about editing or digitizing. It's actually, you know, about integrating and analytics. And frankly, I think we're doing more to communicate today than ever before. Who would have thought that web maps would come into existence? I mean, I literally remember printing maps and having to virtually copy the way that the hand-drawn cartographers had done the maps and organizations before. And that was one of my first experiences after graduating from Pennsylvania. I went to one of the counties, they wanted their tax maps to look exactly like they were hand-drawn. So trying to get a computer to mimic you know, the creativity and the, and the beauty of a hand-drawn map <laughs> used to be challenging. Now it's fairly easy, but you demonstrated this, you know, uh, all morning with your story maps. I think this is a, a key thing for us as GIS professionals to keep in mind. One of the key things is communication has now become an essential skill for a GIS professional. Now, I think the other thing that's really important to keep in mind is Technology is rapidly changing. So it's changing in data, computing, and you know, frankly, GIS is innovating in itself as well. You know, if you think about all the different kinds of data now coming at us. You know, um, I saw a, a commercial on the television this morning. Uh, it was uh, one of the local utility companies was promoting how it's flying drones to do proactive uh, maintenance and uh, spot uh, nest so that it can kind of balance the build environment and the natural environment better. And I think that's a great example. I mean, five years ago, we really didn't have drones. Now drones are everywhere. Um, we're getting real-time information. Uh, there's this whole thing called IoT, the Internet of Things. Well, congratulations, you're all part of IoT if you have an Android or an iPhone. We've all become sensors. And if you're wearing one of these kind of smartwatches, boy, you're, you're constantly amassing information and data that can later be turned around and processed, which I think is, is interesting, <laughs> if not kind of scary. Um, I always, I don't want to meet my digital twin because I think he would be angry at me um, sometimes. In computing, there's been immense changes in computing just in the last three years. Now, one of the things that um, I know many of you kind of manage uh, GIS operations for your organization and you run your own servers. Well, I'll tell you, it's, it's going to be kind of interesting to see all the advancements in that area. I mean, more and more people are taking what used to run on their Dell and they're moving it off into the cloud to run on Amazon or, or Microsoft Azure or, you know, if you're, you're in China, you're probably using Alibaba or everybody's got versions of the cloud. And that, I think that's bringing a lot of new capabilities and frankly, it's making our lives as GIS professionals a little bit easier so we don't have to manage all that hardware too. Um, some of the other things that are going on, I think we're getting exposed to bigger and bigger uh, processing capabilities and data storage capabilities. I was with an organization not too long ago uh, that collects an enormous amount of information from people who use their app to order food and then have it delivered. Um, boy, you talk about a huge pile of data. Uh, that's kind of cool. Without computing, it would not be possible to do what they do. And then GIS. I mean. Boy, I was at Penn State yesterday, and I'm just always humbled to go back to Penn State and see the research that's being done uh, in, in the geography and all the uh, adjoining sciences. It's just remarkable to see what people are both doing with the technology, but also how they're advancing it. Um, 30 years ago, machine learning existed, but boy, today it's, it's actually something that all of us have at our fingertips to, to learn and, and start to take advantage of. So this is a long way of saying, you know, to be a GIS professional, we have to stay contemporary. We have to be aware of the trends. We have to understand the relevance. We can't kind of stay, we, we can't have our feet in cement. 
in other words. We have to be constantly shuffling and learning and, and evolving. The other thing that's got me really interested, and I, I know um, looking over at the vendor booths, you know, some of what they're doing is just amazing and falls right in line with us. I mean, we've never had it so good with access to sensor information. I mean, these are real models. This is a real sea surface temperature visualization. That data is live on the internet and freely available. It's a pretty amazing resource. Um, that's not just you know, flooding. That's not just a pretty map. That map actually has intelligence. It's tied to all the USGS stream gauges. So instead of just saying, hey, the stream gauge is now at you know, three feet over flood zone, it actually takes all that information, all the floodplain information, and does a forecast. Where are the areas that are susceptible to flooding in 24, 48, and 72 hours? That's now a service available from the government. That's what I mean by the transformation is incredible because things that we used to have painstakingly do are now being offered as a service. I also think just in how GIS has evolved, it's also more approachable and frankly, um, you know, this thing I would call WebGIS doesn't discriminate based on the size or the budget of the organization. And as, as we move to the web and as we start to be able to use our phones, I mean, you, you can kind of think about it, is an individual, I mean like any individual, an individual who adopts a highway or adopts a watershed or a trail, literally has the same capabilities with GIS today as a Fortune 50 company. That's remarkable. 30 years ago, boy, you had to have an IT department, you wanted to have licenses were expensive, hardware was expensive, you had to learn a lot. Now I think that's fundamentally changing and get ready because it's gonna continue to change because innovation's happening and people are bringing new applications and new ideas to, to light every day. And what this is really doing for me, just from being able to kind of work with a lot of different organizations and spend a little time understanding how they're using GIS, you, I really have started to see people fundamentally transform how they do things. You know, it's not just like I'm automating things. Like I used to carry a clipboard out into the field. I used to create a sketch and then I used to check three boxes. Well, you know, people can automate that. But what I'm also finding is people are doing way beyond that. They're adding a picture because it's right there on their device. They're immediately capturing the location. They're immediately uh, adjoining it with other databases on the fly. I mean. This is kind of interesting because it's, it's, it's more or less blowing up how we used to do work. And especially as you start to look at all the adjoining technologies that play with us. I would venture to say that my daughter, who is now a freshman in college, would fundamentally attack a problem differently than I would. And I think that's great. And I would encourage, uh, especially those folks from high school, to bring the skills that you've learned as a digital native into the workplace because how you see and how you solve problems is actually one of the greatest skills that you're going to bring to the workforce as you enter it. Now, I think one of the things that's making this all so attractive to people, well, there's some key things like web maps. Wow, it's way easier. We have a template called a story map template. You can quickly put your information in that and then not spend a whole lot of time having to write an application. Things like that, the little apps, the web maps, the ability to stylize things easier now, to be able to change colors, to change symbols, to change characteristics of a map are much easier. And I think that's what's making it more attractive for everybody. I think the other thing is that, frankly, web maps engage people. You're living proof. How many of you have shared a map in the last week? You can raise your hand. And I meant the folks in the other room that I can't see, but raise your hand just so <laughs> we have some audience participation over there. Um, I think most GIS professionals I run to are sharing maps at a greater volume than ever before. And you know what? You're, you're less afraid to do it. Me personally, I'm a horrible cartographer. I am color challenged. And if it wasn't for Cindy Brewer at Penn State and that little color picker, I would be making horrendous maps. You would, yes, you would, you would ridicule me uh, for my color choices because I really do think orange uh, goes with anything. Um, but what's kind of attractive for people is, you know, it's about putting maps out across every medium possible. 
maps are being embedded in websites. They're being displayed on phones. They're being taken to pe with people in the field with a tablet. The same maps available on your PC. We're, this is huge. Dynamic maps available anywhere, anytime. That's, that's a cool concept. And I would go a little bit further to say it's not just maps. Because I think as GIS professionals, we recognize that it's not just a map. It's an intelligent map that is like the tip of the iceberg that portrays probably a lot of science underneath it. You didn't just make a map and sketch something. You actually went through that science of where approach. You organized your information, you analyzed it, and now you're presenting it. And I think that's the key. As GIS professionals, we're helping our organizations send out more authoritative information out to the corners, out to the what they call the edges in an organization, so people are making better decisions. And without GIS professionals, I don't, I don't think that would have happened. Now, I would also suggest that this notion of location intelligence helps everybody understand. In 30 years of asking this question, I've never gotten a negative response. So let me see if I can hold true here in Harrisburg. Is there anything in your organization that is non-geographic? As in, it does not have a place on this earth. Everything is somewhere. So therefore, the universal laws of geography always can be applied to it. And I think that's one of the key things as we as jazz professionals always recognize is by helping people put things on a map and see those patterns and trends that they wouldn't otherwise see, we are in fact, you know, helping people's innate spatial reasoning capabilities become heightened. I mean, face it, how many of you use Google Maps? Seriously? You know, I'm from, I'm, I'm from Esri, right? I mean, <laughs> no, I do too. Um, so we all knew how to navigate before Google Maps. I mean, I learned from a AAA triptych. <laughs> yeah, thank you for laughing, because you're old too. <laughs> um, I'll never forget, my parents literally were arguing on our way to Florida. We lived in, in Wayne, Pennsylvania. It literally got two turns to get on 985, drive on 985 for like two days, take a right and you're in your Disneyland or Disney World. My parents were arguing over that map. I, geez, thankfully, well, with location intelligence, you know, we're, we're eliminating some of those excuses or those challenges in life. I mean, frankly, can you honestly tell me you have a reason to be late to a meeting? I mean, you can't say, I got lost. That's kind of a, a bad one to throw down now because you're like, you're holding your smartphone, you're texting, and you're saying, oh, yeah, I got lost. Not a, not a good one. So Google and all sorts of other companies are leveraging location intelligence to make us smarter, to make us have to worry about a few or less things. And I think that's kind of a key part about location intelligence. Now, what's next? Well, I, I think we're gonna continue to massively change because you know, data is not slowing down, computing is not slowing down, and GIS innovation is not slowing down. And certainly the challenges that GIS professionals are helping their organizations address aren't going away anytime soon. So that's my way of saying, if you're a GIS professional today, you have job security. If you're a high schooler looking at a career, wow, GIS, that's a pretty good career. Now, the other thing that um, I think is really gonna start to happen is, you know, this notion of digital transformation is actually just, just crackling open. Um, I worked with the Port of Rotterdam uh, about three weeks ago, and they're getting ready to invest 100 million euros into the next generation of their digital twin, which by the way is based on GIS. That's going to support autonomous shipping. It's going to support all sorts of innovation that fundamentally, you know, help that port compete with other ports all around the world. 100 million euros, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. They'd never had a budget for GIS before, but now they've kind of started to understand the power of GIS and they're using it as a central part of their digital transformation strategy. I would suggest organizations, countries, government, local governments, institutions are all starting to wake up to the power of location analytics and all working to incorporate it. So here's my challenge to you, my steadfast GIS professional colleagues. 
The thing we can't afford to do is get stuck in our ways. Now, I was lucky enough to get this button from one of our users in Florida. Um, she made all of her staff wear this because as they kind of migrated in their mindset from the way GIS used to be, you know, I, I'm the GIS person, I have to make every map, people have to come to me, and they started to kind of liberate it. Um, you know, she basically pushed GIS out at the edges. She was enabling people across her organization to make their own maps. Um, she was, you know, um, curating the authoritative set of maps for the organization. She built an atlas of their organization. She was pushing all the stuff that was kind of the drudgery work for her and her staff out. And in doing that, she found that they had to let go. So she made everybody wear this button. I thought it was kind of cool. And I started actually, I have this on my wall at work because I can literally apply this to anything uh, that I do. Because once I set myself into a habit, I'm sure maybe like you, it's really hard to change unless you put you know, some mind to it. So I keep this button next to me so that I always can look at it and go, all right, it's okay to try something new. And that would be the, the one big thing I would suggest to you. Now, um, dare I say I, I had included a video which I am not going to play uh, for technical reasons. But I will harken back to 1980. I was uh, in high school myself. I had dreams and aspirations of being an astrophysicist. I mean, I had read every copy of Sky and Telescope magazine from the time I was five. I mean, I love that. I still do. I went to Penn State. That was good. I was gonna, I was gonna do that. And then I accidentally found um, geography. But to make a long story short, this show, does anybody know the show Cosmos? You know, there's, there's, the, there's the original version that was done by Carl Sagan. And now there's the newer version done by Neil deGrasse Tyson, who was actually a, a, a student or, a, or a, a mentoree of, of uh, Sagan's. And whichever one you look at, I think um, the point remains the same. And uh, I have the PowerPoint, and I'd encourage you to play the, the, the video on it when you get to your own computer. Because in the words of the original um, Cosmos um, is the notion that we only have one Earth. You know, it's, a, it's the notion of the pale blue dot. And I think that's, uh, I'll quickly skip the video. Uh, but Carl Sagan's words, I mean, I think he's more like a poet. Uh, so needless to say, I watched that series in 1980. And, you know, it's right before I went off to college. And I, I, I got to admit, I was, I was challenged because here's the leading astrophysicist in the world having a series that's a multi-part series, and he didn't talk about astronomy very much. He actually talked about sciences. He talked about earth sciences. He talked about connectedness. He talked about lots of the lessons that actually I learned once I became a geographer. And I'll tell you, this quote was the bane of my existence from the time I heard it in 1980 on out to today. It still is. It's become the quote that I try to live, live towards. Because as GIS professionals, I actually think it's us that have the best hope of being able to illuminate for people how their world works and how to make better, more informed decisions with it. So I hope uh, this is something that you, you, you take on as a, as a personal mission to some regard as well. Helping people, informing them, helping them make better, more informed decisions. That's, that's, through the use of geography and GIS. Now, um, I was told to challenge the audience, so I, I have to apologize, but you know, spatial reasoning is a, is a core competency of life and work. I, I originally said it was a survival skill, but I figured that would maybe be too drastic. But literally, I remember my first spatial reasoning lesson was taught at the end of my driveway. I lived on a busy road. My mom walks me up to the edge of the driveway and she uses those faithful words. Christopher, look left, look right, and look left. That was what I remember as being my first spatial survival skill. How about you? Remember that lesson? Well, what's odd is my mom's English. So if my mom had been teaching me that lesson in London where she was born, what would she have said? Geography matters. 
<laughs> and I think, you know, as GIS professionals, sometimes we take for granted, you know, how to talk about what GIS uh, or spatial analysis really is. And so here's six, here's six uh, ideas for you to kind of think about or maybe share with people in your organization to help them understand how you can help them. I mean, of course, we can put stuff on a map. Of course, we can find the best locations uh, and paths. But what really gets kind of cool is, you know, lots of people do measuring size and shape and distribution. People detect patterns and quantify, or detect and quantify patterns. Uh, they definitely determine how places are related. These are the things that we do as jazz professionals. And I think we have to continually practice them because in today's world where data science is the new kind of buzzword major, you know, job description, well, congratulations. GIS professionals, you're already a data scientist. That's, that's so at your core, it's, it's ridiculous. So I want you to make sure that you tell your boss um, in a nice way that you're also a data scientist. Because I believe you are, because everybody's trying to move towards making predictions and you've been doing that for a long time. Now, how are you guys leveraging the analytical capabilities of GIS? Would you say you're like all in, well, you're using all six of those things, or like you always kind of go back to the same few? Well, I knew you'd go quiet on me, so congratulations, you've now walked into a pop quiz. <laughs> all right, now I usually make everybody stand up, and then when they get one wrong, sit down, but I won't do that because we're spread across, and frankly, I can't see into the other, uh, other room, so it would be no fun at all for me. So. Um, I'm gonna ask you five questions, they're multiple choice, and you can hold the answer to yourself. Don't, don't cheat, don't share your answer. Um, can everybody see the bottom one, okay? Uh, Bruce, is there any way we can? It looks fine on my screen. Well, I'll have to read them to you. <laughs> this will make, I've never, I've done this quiz so many times, never had this particular challenge, so this is cool. Um, you look at this map, is this predicting where phenomena will move, flow, or spread? Is it calculating geometries and feature distributions? Is it understanding where things are, or is it predicting how and where objects affect wave propagation? You only get to choose one. Does everybody have one? Again, don't cheat, don't share it with neighbors. Ready? Feeling lucky? Just understanding where things are. Does anybody know what's on this map? Pokemon. Oh, yeah, Pokemon. Ooh. Well, let me tell you something. This map happened to be the most viral map in the world for about three weeks. <laughs> we watched it light up on ArcGIS Online and literally go around the world and just explode. It was created by three gamers over a weekend, who figured out how to hack the Niantic API and pull down all the where the Pokemon was gonna be, and they decided to use our API and maps because the terms of use didn't say they couldn't do it. Uh, so if you ever wanna know if uh, ArcGIS Online can uh, scale, well, this was our biggest test ever of auto scale on ArcGIS Online because it literally tested every one of our are parts of our data centers and our kind of global uh, spin-up uh, and automation DevOps. So this is a, this is a, I look at this map and go, wow, that was that was a really expensive map, but it was really cool. And I hope people found Pokemon. <laughs> now this one's kind of interesting. I, I picked this one because, well, you know, I used to go to New Jersey every once in a while to hang out at the shore. Um, I don't mean to you know lop off the rest of Pennsylvania. I'm sorry. Uh, but is this understanding where and when things change? Is it predicting how uh, objects um, affect wave propagation? Is it determining and summarizing what's within an area or areas? Or is it determining overlapping relationships in space and time? I'll just go for it. Sure, it's, this, it's determining and summarizing what's within areas. It's kind of an effective visualization because they're using 
the graduated symbols, the, the circles to illustrate the, the number of shipwrecks. Uh, they're also overlaying kind of renewable energy lease areas. So, you know, you don't have to be a cartographer. You don't have to be a stylistic person in order to make a map that communicates. And I think that's, that's something I want to keep urging you to do, make maps, share maps. This happens to be one of my favorite. Is this, where are the significant hotspots, anomalies, and outliers? Is it understanding where the variations and patterns in values are? Is it predicting where phenomena will move, flow, or spread? Or is it which features and pixels are similar and can therefore be grouped together? This is a really important map, by the way. Oh, come on, I gave it away. It was in the title. <laughs> now, what's so interesting about this is this map was actually used um, it, by the South Carolina legislature to make policy decisions. A GIS analyst in South Carolina actually did analysis to correlate, you know, where are the highest occurrences of low birth weight children being born, and what's the general proximity to the OBGYN providers that they can gain access to? Geography and GIS are impactful. They're important. And when they're used like this, they help policymakers shape better policy. Because it, it doesn't take a GIS or a geographer or to see what the problem is. You can see the areas that are that are gap areas. And thankfully, since this time, action was taken. This is my favorite. Now, I don't know if the animation is going to work, but dang. Come on. Come on. Isn't that cool? It's like moving. All right. Um, is this our spatial patterns changing over time? Is it understanding where and when things change? Is it predicting what if? Or is it determining overlapping relationships in space and time? Competitive over here, I heard it. Yes. All right, well, good. What you're basically looking at is outages in Houston. So the utility there aggregated outages into these, these blocks. It's called a space-time cube. Each slice of the cube represents a different month. So now you're being able to not only visualize, but you're being able to see hotspots emerge and change over time. Can you think of a reason why a utility would want that? How about investing in its assets? Fundamentally changing how it lays out its capital investments for the future, because that's what they did with this map. Last but not least, number five, you've survived so far. You've been assaulted by my words and my, my quiz, but hopefully I'm stimulating you to kind of say, there's more I want to learn. Because this last one is really interesting to me, because it really kind of pulls back on my background um, is this understanding uh, where things are, as in location maps? Is it explain observed patterns and make predictions? Is it determines what's closest, or is it finding the best route, path, or flow along a network? I know you, you already know this one. Sure, it's explaining observed patterns. What you're seeing is actually um, in this case, ArcGIS Pro and R, the world's leading open source statistics package. And there's a, a nice interface between the two of them so that you can actually do a Pearson correlation matrix to try to figure out what are the things that are impacting crime. So as geographers, we can really start to invade other libraries of, of learning and science and math, mathematics to really add even more value to what we learn. It's my last ditch approach to say, it's time to continually invest in your professional development. And learning this language, here's the six, but each of those things kind of broken out into 26 for you. Uh, a PDF of this poster is, a, is available and we'll make sure to put it as a link so that you can 
have a much nicer looking poster than just this PowerPoint slide, but I find that when I'm talking to people who don't know anything about GIS or geography, having this helps me speak to them in a language that is a little bit more understandable. So I hope you'll use this as a resource. All right, let me, uh, let me start drawing this to a close. I wanted to end with giving you three, three ideas. And, and again, this is just my, based on my observations of spending the last 14 years traveling the globe uh, and getting to meet with so many different people that frankly are so like us all um, here in central Pennsylvania. The first is curate the atlas of your organization. There is not a decision maker or frankly, <laughs> A person who's gone to even elementary school doesn't know what an atlas is. Everybody's experienced an atlas. Most people look at it and wonder. Some people just have it on their coffee table and never open it. Create the atlas of your organization. Curate it. Don't just let it go static. It's not a book. It's a living atlas. Bring the living atlas of your organization to life. Illustrate the key things that your organizations care about. You know, what are the big objectives or, or the big strategies this year that your organization is trying to push for? Create a series of maps. Organize those maps uh, by chapter, just like a, an atlas does. You all know how to make story maps. And by the way, if you ever see weird hits from China or Singapore or Australia or New Zealand or Canada or Mexico or Chile, that's probably me referencing your website. So I, I apologize in advance because the folks here told me they were getting all sorts of weird website traffic. It's because I've had this on my slide ever since Bruce showed it to me. And I'm so proud of Pennsylvania. I, I literally show Pennsylvania maps in any presentation I do all over the world. So that's a big one though. The, the second one, and it's, these are simple things, democratize mapping. You don't need to be the organization's mapper. It's okay for people to make ugly maps. They've been making ugly bar charts far longer. So, you know, I always thought of, you know, cartography is actually in the eye of the beholder and the eye of the user. I, I could never be a, a cartographic critic. And I don't, I don't think it's something that I would, I wouldn't recommend taking that on. Enable people to make maps, hold workshops to help them make less ugly maps and more functional maps. You learn those lessons over your career and through school. I would, I would uh, encourage you to do the same thing because you know the best map is the map that's shared and actually used. And last but not least, my, my, this one's uh, obviously easy. It's invest in yourself. It, it, being a jazz professional requires lifelong learning and there's a bunch of resources available from Esri but also throughout the internet available in terms of free stuff on YouTube and uh, Coursera and the Penn State uh, online uh, web certificate programs. I mean, take advantage of that stuff. Keep your skills current, learn new things. Don't get planted in cement. Uh, and you know, if you need to make your own version of that button to help people in your organization, you know, think about you and what you do differently. So, on this GIS day, congratulations. You've now officially survived your full year as a GIS professional. Now go look forward to the next 364 until you come back and celebrate your 11th annual GIS day here. Thank you very much for letting me come. Thank you, Chris. Um, can we have another round of applause for Chris taking the time out to come here back home and uh, speak to us today? He is going to be around the rest of the afternoon. Um, he'll be over in the exhibit hall, wandering around. Uh, I think he's going to be based out of the Esri booth with, with Bruce. So please take the opportunity. This is a great opportunity to speak to someone that, as, as he said, has, has lived this for um, in and out for the last 14 years, but I'm sure longer than that. So next up is the lunch round table it's back over at um, hack midtown so if you want to make your way over there pick a tape pick a lunch pick a table of with a topic that you'd like to maybe get to know a little bit better and we'll see you over there don't forget um, the actual concurrent sessions start again at one o'clock and please take this time to get into the exhibit hall and talk with the exhibitors that are here
they've got a lot of good ideas and they'll they'll talk your ear off if you want. Thanks everyone.